Passover is six weeks from tomorrow night. Six weeks from tomorrow night. For we take the symbols of the broken body and shed blood of Jesus Christ. But anyway, we all need to get ready. I need to get ready. I'm a human being. I have mistakes and faults and sins. And all of us have vanity, jealousy, lust, and greed. And all of us need to be getting ready for the Passover and really thinking about it as the way we should. And uh, Mr. King, uh, Mr. Excuse me, Wally Smith touched on that, of course, in his sermonette about what kind of example are you? What kind of fruit do we show? We do need to examine ourselves. Turn with me, if you would, brethren, to 2 Corinthians, a very fundamental scripture you've heard read many times if you've been in the church, connected with the Passover, but other times as well. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. Examine yourselves, Paul writes, as to whether you are in the faith. Prove yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you are disqualified? Now many people come and sit in God's church. And we had 150,000 people, and perhaps 100,000 of them or so were baptized. But I knew, and I told my wife, and I told a few other key friends, well, I know occasionally I would say I, this person or that obviously is not converted. I could sense that. I, I was a minister, and that was one of my strengths. I could perceive people's attitudes, not perfectly. But when people begin to act weird, and they're carnal, and that's all they can talk about, or other things they get into, you can tell they're not really converted. They're just sitting there. And we recognize that. I think we have a much higher percentage of people that are really converted in the living church of God than when worldwide got so big. And Mr. Armstrong said, I don't think even half of you, brethren, are converted. And he used to say that again and again, many times. Nor the end, he says, I'm not sure that more than a tithe, one out of ten of you are really converted. And that was more accurate, <laughs> as we found out when the greatest apostasy in modern times came along and the church split in over 300 different directions and now we're having more splits. Many men want to be important and they don't have necessarily the need to do it as we did back when we started Globin. We were the only one beside Ted Armstrong and Gerald Furry that were stepping out to do something. And I heard Gerald Furry's tapes and heard him on the radio. And my wife said, why are you listening to him? Or he'd been one of my students too. Well, I said, I want to at least see. And I got his Malachi's message, which was all a big attack on Mr. Dukach and all that group. That's about all. He was twisting, twisting, twisting many scriptures. Some fit, some didn't fit. I'd been his teacher. I knew that. He was twisting all these scriptures, trying to make them say something they were not saying. I realized that's not the place to go. And Mr. Armstrong has told us all, don't go with my son Ted. He's a rebel. So what could I do? I saw the greatest apostasy in modern times coming along, and we had to do something. And I've told you the story. We did do something. And that's why we're here, and that's why God is going to bless this work greatly if we keep on the ball and keep trying to do the work as we should. But we're not just trying to go out to start something to be important. I tried not to. My wife tried to push me to do it a year ahead, as she knows. And uh, even uh, insulted my masculinity in a certain sense, since they, you know, had the courage to do something a year ahead. But I, I the way she said it, but, you know, I, I, uh, I don't want to put her down. I didn't mean that, but help you to realize, you no, know, I was not anxious to just rush out and start another church. A lot of people were anxious to get something going, and it was true, something had to be done. But I said, we're not sure yet. We've got to be sure. Finally, we were sure when they came out with the God is booklet and the idea of being born again now and the whole thing about prophecy addiction and all the other stuff that showed they were turning away from everything the church was teaching. And of course, I heard in a private conversation uh, with one of the key evangelists in their private meetings, they were planning to turn away from everything. Everything that distinguished us from mainstream Christianity said, Mike and Joe want to go mainstream and that's what they're going to do. And that's what they did do. Step by step, they turned up the heat, like the frog in the pan, you know, that keeps sitting in the pan as the, as the heat is slowly stepped up. Well, we had to do something, and we're here, but we're trying to preach the full truth. And I think most of you do appreciate that, and you want that, but you have human nature. And I have human nature in spite of stepping out, and I appreciate your stepping out, but I can't help you 
if I don't preach the, the straight, straight truth to you and help you examine yourselves and help me examine myself as all of us should do all the time, all through the year, and particularly before the Passover. Examine yourselves. Is Christ really living in you? Sometimes just a little bit. Sometimes a fair amount. And none of us have Christ fully living in us the way we should. But we have to think about that, pray about that, and analyze that. As you look to Christ and Him alone, or I should ask, do you look to Christ and Him alone as your Savior and guide? One thing that's really, I think Satan is stirring up people to start a different movement here where they're beginning to look to someone else beside Christ without realizing it. And we've got to learn to do better. Do some look to us? Maybe some look to, you know, like they did. I don't think many do because we don't have the charisma the Armstrongs had. But maybe some look to me or they look to Mr. Ames or look to someone else. Some of the brethren, some of the older brethren are beginning to look to Mr. Armstrong, not in the way he told them to. He told you, don't worship me. He told people over and over, follow me only as I follow Christ. And I've heard him say that perhaps a hundred times, and I'm not exaggerating. Over and over he said that, but they want to follow him no matter what. He didn't say that, but they're trying to make a religion out of Armstrongism. We've got to look to Jesus Christ. We don't honor by Mr. Armstrong by following him blindly. And he said a number of times, Herbert Armstrong has made hundreds of mistakes. And he did make mistakes, and he did make mistakes in doctrine that were never changed back again either, by the way, and I could show you some. But he was a sincere man, a wonderful man that I knew as a second father, and all my family knows I feel that way, but I don't worship him, and you should not either. And I'm telling you, brethren around the world, don't do that. You are dishonoring Mr. Armstrong, and you are dishonoring everything Mr. Armstrong stood for if you try to worship him and follow him blindly. That is not right. and We've got to get that straight in our minds and how important it is that we look to Jesus Christ as our Savior. Herbert Armstrong did not die for your sins. I have not died for your sins. None of us have. Jesus Christ died for your sins, and Jesus Christ is the living head of the church. And we've really got to learn that deeply in our minds and respond to that. So some people unwittingly, unwittingly try to make a religion out of what we might call Armstrongism, out of inventing a certain thing, uh, an idea of, of Mr. Armstrong's that they, they uh, looked to, and it wasn't the real religion of Mr. Armstrong at all, necessarily, and the, what he would teach. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians, if you would, chapter 10, chapter uh, 1, I mean. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, brethren, and beginning in verse 10. Paul writes, here's the Bible, and what did Mr. Armstrong say? Mr. Armstrong said over and over again, live by every word of God. That's what he told us. That's why I appreciate him. He would back down when Herman Hay and Raymond McNair and I and some of us would read his stuff and go to him or he'd talk to us about some idea, read aloud a, a projected article or booklet in front of several of us. We would say, well, Mr. Armstrong, what about this and that? And when we'd explain, it was a little different way, he would back down every time if we had the truth. And sometimes we did or we wouldn't bring it up. He did listen to counsel in those eight, in that time. He said, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are con con contentions among you. Now I say this, that each one of you says, now here's the church of God. They weren't a pagan church. They were the church of God at Corinth. That's what it says in verse 2 here. To the church of God which is at Corinth, sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be saints. That's what the second verse says. These were God's people, but they were weak. And they were following men. One says, I'm of Paul. Another says, I'm of Apollos. Another one says, I'm of Peter or I'm of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, Paul asks? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Were you baptized in the name of Herbert Armstrong? Were you baptized in the name of Roderick Meredith or Richard Ames? No, none of you were. 
Please understand that, brethren. I'm not just yelling at you. I'm talking to the people around the world. And I hope all of you get the point. We need to wake up on this point. He says in verse 17, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. What is the gospel? Is it just the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, and nothing else? Listen to what your Bible says. It's been there all these years. To preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect, for the message of the cross. Oh, he talks about the gospel, and when he starts to explain it, what is it? The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, and the New King James is far more accurate on many of these verses, not that you are saved, you're being saved, it is the power of God. So he describes that. The message of the cross is part of the gospel. And Mr. Armstrong knew that. And Mr. Armstrong talked about that a number of times. I tell you, before God and Christ, it's mentioned in his literature. More often he mentioned the kingdom of God, but two or three times I heard him, in a sense, apologize and say, brethren, I'm afraid I've led you too much in talking to just about the kingdom of God and the government of God and the law of God, and we appear to be leaving out Jesus Christ. He said, we must not do that. Christ is an important part of the gospel. And our salvation has everything to do with the gospel. What is the good news? Read my booklet again, The True Gospel. There are four elements in the gospel. One is salvation, forgiveness of sin, the good news that we can be forgiven our sins through Jesus Christ and His sacrifice. That's wonderful good news. You think about that. Most of us don't like to think of ourselves as sinners, but we should. We're the church of the forgiven. And every one of us has had sins, and we've got to be forgiven our sins, and we keep on making sins and mistakes. And Christ has to keep applying His sacrifice to us. So that's the first thing. The second aspect of the gospel is after repentance and baptism, you receive the Holy Spirit. Then you can grow in grace and in knowledge and have a certain amount of good fruit and that good life that Mr. Smith talks about. That's the second part of the good news. What's the third part of the good news? The gospel, which simply means good news. The third part is Christ later is coming back as King of Kings to this earth and to set up the government of God all over the earth and peace will break out all over the earth under Christ's rule and God's law. And we are being trained, hopefully to be loyal to the church of God, loyal to the government of God, to learn that teamwork so we can be there as kings and priests in that coming kingdom. The fourth part of the gospel is the ultimate good news. And Mr. Smith's sermonette touched on that. He didn't bring it in in that particular way. That was not his theme. But as you read there in John 17, he said that I may live in you and you in me and that we may become one in God and the glory which God gave me, I have given them, meaning us. Jesus said, the glory that you have given me, I have given them the very glory of God that we will have to become full sons of God and the God level of existence. That is the most awesome, mind-boggling, fantastic, inspiring thing your mind can imagine, but most of us don't think about it. God made us in His image to literally become like He is someday and to live forever as God beings in the family of God interacting with Jesus and the Father and helping plan projects on Alpha Centauri and Pluto and Jupiter and all these planets and throughout the universe probably, certainly indicated of the increase of His kingdom, there will be no end. And we're going to be part of that if we will overcome, if we will humble ourselves, if we will learn to be loyal and follow Christ and follow Christ's government and be part of God's work and not think, well, I'll just get excited or I'll get upset or I'll run off here and run off there and do my own thing. How can God trust you throughout all eternity if you're just willing to run off every time your feelings get hurt? That's ridiculous. I did not do that. Just tell you that. I did not do that. I had plenty of excuses to do that, as I've told you before. And I'm not perfect, but I did not do that. And God helped you not to do that. But we've had some do that more recently, and that's a terrible shame. So, the gospel has everything to do with our personal forgiveness. And we do need to really understand that and appreciate it. 
So these things are vital elements of the gospel, the kingdom of God, but also the forgiveness of our sins through Jesus Christ. Now turn to Ephesians, if you would, brethren. Ephesians chapter 1, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 3. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. After the introduction, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. From the beginning, God intended that we be in His family. That's, one of, that's the biggest single error Mr. Armstrong makes, because he did make some eight mistakes in his Mystery of the Ages. Read it four or five times. He indicates very clearly that God's plan was to have angels rule the world and the universe. And like the creation of man in God's image was plan B. It was not plan B at all. So Mr. Armstrong made mistakes. Am I trying to put him down? No, I have made more mistakes, I'm sure, and I'll make my mistakes. But we don't want to worship him, and we don't want to worship me, and we don't want to worship anybody but Jesus Christ and God the Father. That's my point. Just as he chose us before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to begettal, as it should be, the Greek word means to make a son, begettal, as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the goodness of his praise. In him we have redemption through his blood. Oh, it talks about the blood of Jesus Christ. Some of us haven't heard much about it. Well, that's old Protestantism. No, that's right here in the epistles of Paul. The precious blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, which had to be shed for our sins because we need that. All of us need that. We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace, which He made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He purposed in Himself, that in the dispensation, listen to this interesting wording, in the dispensation of the fullness of times, you see, in God's final time, the wrap-up of everything, He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and on earth in Him. We're all going to be made members of the same family through Jesus Christ. And then, as it says in 1 Corinthians 15, Christ Himself will finally turn over the kingdom to His Father, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, breathed destined. That's our God's purpose from the beginning. According to the purpose of Him who works all things according to His counsel, uh, the counsel of His will, that we who first trusted in Christ, he's talking about the Jews, should be to the praise of His glory. And in Him, you, you Gentile believers there in Ephesus, you also trusted after you heard the word of truth. What? The gospel of the kingdom? No. The word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Oh, Sometimes it doesn't say the gospel of the kingdom in your Bible. It's the gospel, read it, verse 13, the gospel of your salvation. That's good news to be saved, and that is a part of the gospel. In whom you also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. You see, when God finally makes us full members, buys us back from sin, and makes us full members of His family, redeems us through Christ's blood to the praise of His glory. So that is what God intends to do. And He's going to make us full members of His kingdom after redeeming us, buying us back, so to speak, through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So we need to emphasize this more, brethren, Christ's sacrifice. We need to emphasize this more, not less. And I'm not going to back down from preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of His death and His resurrection to pay for our sins and to reconcile us to God. God will bless us more. God will guide our lives more. We'll be richer if we deeply understand that's a vital part of the gospel. I could take the whole rest of the sermon on that, but I have mentioned some of that to you a couple weeks ago, other scriptures, and yet others we can mention in future sermons. That's so important. Are you willing to see Christ's sacrifice as a vital part of the gospel? 
Are you willing to grow in grace and in knowledge, all you brethren out there on this point? Are you going to say, well, Mr. Armstrong just talks about the gospel of the kingdom, and that's what he said, and that's all we can have, it's just the gospel of the kingdom. And if you talk about the gospel of Christ or the gospel of salvation, you're all wrong. No, we're not all wrong. We're preaching the Bible. We're preaching the Bible, and we must live by every word of God, and if we grow in this particular area, when Mr. Armstrong sees me and you in the resurrection, and I certainly plan to be there, God willing, and I'm sure he'll be there, he'll be glad. He'll say, well, of course, Rod, I told you guys to keep growing and growing. That's what he always told us to do. So if we're able to refine certain things as we go along, he'll understand that when he's a spirit being. He told us many times, brethren, and asked Mr. Apartian. I'm not trying to just pick on Mr. Apartian, but he and I are the only ones that go back to that time and remember these things. And he told us personally and in ministers' meetings many times. He said, fellows, I had to come to the truth one point at a time. And I had this old Protestant idea in my mind and had to get out of that here and there and gradually get things cleaned up. He says, I haven't got it all straight yet. He said that a number of times. He knew that. He had to come out of Protestantism one point at a time. And I honor him. And as he said, he saw they talking so much about Jesus and the precious blood of Jesus that he tended to go to the opposite extreme. And he said that publicly more than once. And he said, fellows, I think I made a mistake and maybe taking it too far the other way. And we don't talk enough about Jesus Christ and his sacrifice, Mr. Armstrong said. That's why I put that letter written by him, December 12th, 1958. You saw that, and uh, we've got that, I think, actually just copied, photographed, in one of the recent, uh, I guess it's right in the magazine that'll be, maybe hasn't come out yet, but we, we read it to you, and you'll be seeing it in print, what Mr. Armstrong himself wrote. This is not some new, some new doctrine. <laughs> he knew that. He just emphasized it more because he saw the Protestants where that's all they talked about, and he saw that. So to get us from here over here, he let's say to get us from here to the middle, he went beyond the middle without realizing, and he went way over here, and once in a while he tried to, to pull us back to the middle. But well, we're going to get back to the middle, and I think God wants us to do that. So let's not think we're turning away from Mr. Armstrong. We're not. I'm not ever going to turn away from him. I honor him. I love him. And I plan on seeing him in a few years. But he was not perfect. And he'd say, yeah, you're right. <laughs> he knew that very deeply. And I know I'm not perfect. You better worship Christ and him alone. So you better learn to see Christ's sacrifice as a vital part of the gospel, my brethren. Think. Luke 4, verse 4, Jesus Christ said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. That is where it's at. That is where it's at. Not following some man's personal interpretation of Mr. Armstrong taking a certain point in time and saying, well, here's what Mr. Armstrong said there, or where he wrote there, and I'm going to jerk out that sliver of it and put my slant on it and try to make a religion out of that. No, don't do that. That is not right. The Seventh-day Adventists kind of have, in a sense, uh, worshiped the writings of Ellen G. White, as you know. She was their prophetess. And they'll often take her writings over the Bible. The Christian scientists follow the writings of this uh, woman prophetess that, uh, that they had, Mary Baker Eddy. And the Mormons will sometimes follow the writings of Joseph Smith and his ideas instead of the Bible. Mr. Armstrong even said, he says, I hope no one ever does that with my writings. I've heard him say that. He knew that was a human tendency. People want to look to a man. Somehow they can't seem to look to an invisible God. They want to get a human hero. Christ was human. Let him be your hero. Let him be your guide let him be your living head and the Savior who died for you and have deep appreciation. He was in the human flesh, but now he's God sitting at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. He's alive. He will never die, and he will never turn aside. But now some are developing a form of Armstrong worship, and they're not looking to Jesus Christ as their Savior. 
They're looking to think they'll be saved if they try to read every word and get everything Mr. Armstrong said and follow just exactly that way. And he never thought that. He never did that. He kept changing. And as Mr. Ames said, Mr. Armstrong was forward-looking and innovative. He would change and modify. And I know you, all of you know, he changed three different times on makeup. For the first 20 years, we had more miracles, more divine healings in the church. And I mean that before God in Christ, we had more divine healings and miracles than we did later. But the women were wearing makeup. And then after they changed makeup, we had fewer. It wasn't just because of that, but that's what happened nevertheless. <laughs> then we had a number of years when women weren't supposed to wear it, and then Mr. Armstrong realized he'd gone overboard, and then he wrote in the bulletin how he did not want our women to look like Salvation Army women, and he, thought, he, said, he told me, Rod, he said, my, my uh, uh, daughter Beverly has held with me going to visit King Leopold and his wife wears makeup and makeup is regarded as an article of dress of cultured refined women around the world. And I went overboard saying that's like harlots and Hollywood whores and he said I shouldn't have done that. So he changed it back. And then near the end of his life he did have another emotional thing frankly with his second wife like he had with his daughter the first time and changed it back again. But he never changed the Sabbath. He never changed the holy days. This was an administrative decision that was frankly changed for emotional reasons. I'm just going to say that. I mean that. I know that. I think, what did the Bible say? Well, the Bible didn't say anything. We know, and history shows you, that Israel came out of Egypt and they wore makeup. And God says, don't follow the, the, what you learned in Egypt quite a number of times as you read you know, Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. And he tells you, do, don't do this and don't do that. But there's not one half. If you find it, you tell me, brethren, I challenge you. There's not one half of one verse ever condemn me makeup. If you know where it is, you tell me. You can't find it because it is not there. But at any rate, that's not a major issue. Of course, if you don't want to wear it, that's fine. But if you do want to wear it, you don't need to be condemned about it. We need not to judge each other. Some of us men wear loud ties and some of our young men work out too much at the weights and look at themselves in the mirror too much. Well, I kind of smile at them, you know, but well, okay, I went through that stage too. Those are just human elements of vanity. We can't say don't be vain here, don't be vain there, don't be vain there. Yes, women can wear too much and show off. Some women can wear a certain kind of clothing that's wrong or too loud or bright or too short or too too tight or too whatever and show off. I know that. Or you all know that. And some of those things are much worse than makeup. If woman, a woman is showing off her body in a sexually suggestive way, that's far worse than my mother and Mrs. Ditson and Mrs. Troutman and Mrs. Bradley and all of her ladies, friends, middle-aged ladies, very decent women. I got to know them back there. All wore makeup. It was done even more universally back in the 1930s and 40s than it is today. They were not harlot women. They were middle class women going to the Methodist and Baptist and Presbyterian church and that was just an article of dress. That's just what they did. A man put on his tie, a woman put on her wake makeup. That's what they all did. They did that. And that was not a sin. But at any rate, let's get it straight. Let's try to think of the big things. What does God say? What does God say? That's what we've got to live by not try to make some major issue, but as I say, if some young woman has her dress way up here, real tight or something, and is trying to show off her body, then she is inciting lust in men, and that is 10 times worse than some woman wearing makeup, but which is not bad at all, as long as she wears it in moderation. So anyway, we need to understand that and get those things straight. And we've got to get the, 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 the picture here, and, and I hope that, that you will, brethren, get these things straight. So, brethren, you and I need to grow in the area of looking to Jesus Christ. And the resurrection, Mr. Armstrong, will be pleased that we would grow in grace and in knowledge. I know he will. The good news has a great deal to do with Christ and his sacrifice, which we're looking forward to observing at the Passover the very first sermon in the New Testament Church of God, the very first sermon, 
was given on the day of Pentecost by the Apostle Peter. What was that about? Just the kingdom of God and Christ's second coming? No, turn to it. Acts, if you would. Acts chapter 2. Most of you know this very well. Acts chapter 2 and beginning in verse 36. I'm going to get a little bit of this tea here, then I can shout at you a little bit better. <laughs> I'll get some of this tea and honey. Acts 2, 36, Peter is preaching, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Here's the first sermon. They were cut to the heart and said to Peter, the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And did Peter say, Believe in the gospel of the kingdom and look forward to Christ's second coming because that's the only thing we can talk about? No, no, he didn't say that. He said then, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. That's such a wonderful thing. I know when I was baptized as a 19-year-old kid, for several weeks I had an overwhelming desire to do that and waited and waited because I thought about all the dirty jokes and all the rotten ideas and all the violence and selfishness and vanity and cheating and, and rottenness that I did all through high school and junior college. I thought, boy, I'm a real skunk. And I was there, which I was, and I was there at Ambassador College and and Herman Hay and Ken Herman were a little older and more sedate, more intellectual and academic, drank too much on occasion, took God's name in vain on occasion, which I should never have done, and other things, cheating and lying and lusting and so on. And I knew I needed to be forgiven. And Mr. Armstrong baptized me in the lower gardens of Ambassador College. Some of you know that place. But I, I really meant it. And I didn't have perfect repentance. I didn't have a total repentance, perhaps to the same degree he did, where he said he felt like a burned out hunk of junk. But I knew I really needed to be forgiven of my rottenness and my rebellion. And I could show other examples, but I better not tell all my sins. You'll say, well, you're a real sinner. I can't follow you, okay? <laughs> you're not following me. You're following Christ. So you better follow Christ and not worry about what I did in high school. <laughs> Anyhow, we're baptized for the remission of sins. What is sin? Sin is the transgression of the law, breaking God's law. That's what sin is. I grew up in the Methodist church, and my old Methodist grandmother was a wonderful woman. And I loved her dearly. I got to know her better than any of my other grandparents because she outlived them all by decades and spent a lot of time with her. She was really kind and good. But boy, she was a hell-for-leather, old-fashioned Methodist. And I've told you about that, you know. She didn't talk about Cabernet Sauvignon. <laughs> if she heard about wine or beer, liquor, the liquor traffic, you know. And the way she said it, you knew it was evil. <laughs> and she was down on liquor and down on dancing and down on card playing and down on going to movies and all the old Methodist do's and don'ts, the old-fashioned Methodists. Now, the Methodists have loosened up a lot today. I think to get kicked out of the Methodist church today, you almost have to shoot the preacher. Then they might kick you out. I'm not sure they would even then. Anyway, I'm partly kidding, partly not. <laughs> but at any rate, you better repent of your sins. They need to be forgiven. And you shall receive the gift. It's a promised gift of the Holy Spirit. After real repentance, you have God's Holy Spirit, part of His very nature. And I realized as I was in Ambassador College and these other fellows were better, and I thought, boy, I have all these. And Raymond and Marion were mentioning sometimes uh, words and expressions, and I would kind of smirk. I thought, that's a nasty thing. But they didn't know what they were saying. They didn't. They were, they, I realized they just didn't get it. I had all this foul thing from my background on the football team and working in the woods, and they were so innocent they didn't know that. I thought, you are a real rat. And I've got to be forgiven. And how can I get help? Well, the only way to get help was to accept Jesus Christ and be baptized. And I knew then God's Holy Spirit would come in and help me. And about six or nine months later, after I'd been baptized, I didn't plan it and try to start taking, giving, you know, keeping a chart. But it suddenly hit me one day. You know, Rod, you have really changed. 
and I don't have all those evil thoughts in the same way, and I was doing better. I'm not bragging. I didn't do as well as I should have done, but I realized I had help. I had help that I had never had before, and I was very grateful for that. But you've got to repent for the promise, the promise of God's Holy Spirit is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So Peter talked on a lot, and we read some of it here and a lot more that he obviously said we don't read. We just get the highlights of these things in, in the Bible. He told them how rotten their generation was and how to repent and the sins they needed to come out of and, and this type of thing, I'm sure. But the very first preaching of the gospel was about the good news of our forgiveness for sins through Jesus Christ and His sacrifice and the promise of the Holy Spirit. Tremendous parts of the gospel, the true gospel. Turn now to 1 Corinthians, if you would. 1 Corinthians 15, and I did go there, I know, a few weeks ago when I preached on the true gospel in Christ, but I'm going to read just a little bit of it this time. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, Paul writes, I declare to you the gospel. Okay, he says, here is the gospel. Does he talk about Christ's second coming and the kingdom of God? No. Here is the gospel that I preach to you, which you received and in which you stand, by which you are saved if you hold fast that word. You've got to keep going on. He that endures to the end, not he that gives up and quits which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, all right, here's that gospel, first of all, which I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. So the very first thing he preached in his gospel was that Christ died for our sins. That is wonderful good news. And that he was buried and that he rose again. That's wonderful news. And they all knew that. A lot of them had met people who had seen him being crucified, seen him after he was risen. Wow, they must have had an exhilaration and chills up and down their spine when they realized that, according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, or Peter, and then by the Twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained of this present, but some have fallen asleep. So by the time Paul wrote this, some of those men had fallen asleep, but over 500 men and women had seen him after he had risen from the dead. It was beginning to spread. Many people had a neighbor, a cousin, an uncle, or somebody that said, I saw him after all you people saw him hanging on that stake and the Roman soldier jamming this spear in and the blood come gushing out and he screamed and his head slumped forward and the blood gushed down and he was dead, dead as a doornail. I saw him. I saw him. He is risen. He is risen. And you read that over and over in the book of Acts. How wonderful they felt about that and how inspiring that was as part of the good news. I wish we could go back and see all those things. We'd have more faith than we do. But God lets us read it and God gives us a different type of human physical witness through the powerful prophecies affecting major nations because we're near the end of that coming government, uh, near the end of the coming government of God, or near the beginning of it, I should say, near the arrival and near the end of this society. So he gives us that to prove that God is real, not just some sentimental idea. So you and I need a Savior. That's part of the good news. And brethren, as we approach the Passover, we, we've got to focus on that, our need of a Savior and how wonderful that is. So let's think about that as the Passover approaches. Turn back to the very first of the Bible now, and here you'll see how God had this in mind from the very beginning. Genesis. Genesis, as you know, means the begetting, the beginning or the creating, and the very beginning. Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve had to be put out of the Garden of Eden, 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 then God said to Adam, verse 17, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In uh, toil you shall eat of it. 
and uh, all the days of your life, but thorns and thistles it shall bring forth. And the sweat of your face shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. Dust you are, and to dust you shall return. He was making it very clear. You have sinned, and you're going back to the dust. You're going back to the grave. As you know, brethren, a lot of you older brethren, Romans 6.23 tells us, Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. And that's what he told Adam and Eve. You're going back to the dust. So you're under the death penalty. And the only way you're going to get out from it is through this, a Savior, obviously, through some other means, and it turned out to be the Savior. Chapter 4, Genesis 4, now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she bore Cain. He says, I've gotten a man from the Lord. And she bore again Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering to fruit of the ground to the eternal. Abel also brought of the firstlings of his flock. Now we don't read the whole story, but if you read this and many other references in the Bible, it's obvious that God taught Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and God must have taught Cain and Abel, and they knew that he wanted a blood sacrifice but Cain thought, well, Sunday's just as good as Saturday. I'll just worship God on Sunday, if you follow me. You know, I can give what I'm doing over here and what's convenient for me because I'm raising uh, uh, vegetables or grains, and I'll just give those. And I don't need to offer a blood sacrifice like Abel. I'll worship God the way I want. God says, no, you're to worship God the way he says. You're to worship God in spirit and in truth. And God had told them this. So he brought then Abel of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat, and the Lord respected Abel and his offering. And that made Cain very angry, just like people get angry at us if we tell them we have the truth. And they said, who gives you the right to be right? You're self-righteous. See, that's the first thing. Human beings don't like to be put down. They think their idea is as good as anyone else's. And so that gets them on their high horse. It gets them all stirred up because his brother was willing to worship God the way God said, not according to his human imagination. But right away, there was an animal sacrifice. Blood was shed. Blood was shed. A little pre-enactment of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ pointing to that, going clear back, going clear back to the very beginning. Now we turn to Genesis 22, Genesis chapter 22, verse 1. Most of you know this story well. I won't read it all. Here he's talking about whom? George Jones? No. He's talking about the father of the faithful. This is a special example. Abraham was a type of God the Father, and Isaac was a type of Jesus Christ. And so it came to pass, Genesis 22, verse 1, that God tested Abraham. He was going to make him the father of the faithful. He tested him many times. This was the biggest, the biggest test of all. And he said, Abraham, and he said, I'm here. He said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. Abraham had waited and waited to have one legitimate son through Sarah, and finally by a miracle that son was given. You take this special son and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains. Wow. Then you read the story about Abraham got there had tied up his son, who apparently was so obedient he didn't wrestle with his father, but he was already a big teenager, maybe 20 years old, according to Hebrew. He was, he was the one that was carrying the heavy load of wood for his father. And he was totally obedient, a type of Christ. And then Abraham took out the knife and was just ready to slip, slit his son's throat like they would the lamb, lying down and lifted up his head gently. Just one move, he'd have been gone. And the blood had come pouring out of Isaac. And at the last minute, God said loudly, don't do that. Stop. And I have provided another sacrifice. And then, as you know, because God was so pleased with Abraham's attitude that he said, of course, uh, well, uh, trying to go back here uh, in verse 12, he said, do not lay your hand on the ladder, do anything to him, for now I know. He really was testing the man to be the father of the faithful. Now I know that you fear God, a deep awe of God, beyond what most people have ever had. 
since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And he went on and gave other tremendous blessings. So here again, what happened? This Isaac was a, an exact type, like the Passover lamb. He was the Passover lamb about to be sacrificed by Abraham as a type of God the Father. Years in advance, 3,500 years earlier, here he was pre-enacting the Passover. The Passover is a big thing in God's mind and the need for a sacrifice for sin. Then you turn to Exodus, if you would. Exodus now, brethren, and let's turn to Exodus chapter 12. Again, we just want to read the highlights because it's very familiar to most of you. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, saying, This month shall be the beginning of months. Speak to the congregation. Tell them to save up a lamb, an unblemished male lamb, you see, from the tenth day of the month, and on the fourteenth, you're to slit its throat. On the fourteenth, save it up, a perfect lamb without blemish. Now, verse 6, you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the month, and then the whole assembly sh shall kill it at twilight, or at dusk, and they shall take some of the blood and put it on the do two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. This is a sign that they were willing to trust in God. They, slay, they slew this lamb. All over that land, the households of Israel who were faithful, and if their household was too small, they would share it with one or two neighbor families. And he said, in uh, verse uh, four, or 12, For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. Now the blood, and in our day, what is it? The precious blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, very God translated into the human flesh. His life is worth more than all of our lives, and we have to understand that. Because you read in John, the first few chapters, verses, I mean, of the Gospel of John, that the Word in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were created by Him, and without Him nothing was created. God made you and me. He made Adam and Eve. He made everything He made through Jesus Christ. If I'm able to build a whole bunch of robots, am I worth more than the robots, even though there are a lot of them? Of course. I'm the one that created them. But using that analogy, that's the way God looks at it. I think that's the way it is. His son's life was able to pay for all our sins. He was the perfect sacrifice. And so he says, Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, typifying the precious blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. That's where the word Passover comes from. You see, God passes over. God forgives our sins if we really repent, really repent. And not many people do that the way they should. But if we really repent, then we're under the blood of Jesus Christ and have our sins forgiven. So we want to really appreciate that profoundly. Now let's turn, if you would, to uh, Isaiah. Isaiah this time, brethren, and I'm going to turn to chapter 52. Isaiah, chapter 52. This prophecy, as virtually all scholars know, and even the carnal liberal scholars, the higher critics have to admit by so many other things that Isaiah was written about when it was written 700 years before Christ. But what it was just written 200 years ahead didn't really make any difference. But it was written about 700 years ahead of time. And here he's writing about the coming Messiah who's been referred to a number of times in the Bible. But he says here in Isaiah 52, verse 13, Behold my servant, the special servant, the special prophet, who is the Christ, would come. He shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many as were astonished at you, so his visage that is, the face of Jesus Christ was marred more than any man. When he was beaten up by the Jews and by the Romans, and back to the Jews again, if you get a harmony of the Gospels, and I taught out of the harmony for about 40 years as teaching the freshman Bible class, you read how sometimes they hit him, 
Other times they slapped him. Other times they beat him with rods, which means clubs. And they would put a blindfold over him and then hit him in the face. Come on, smart aleck. Prophesy who hit you if you know so much. Ha, ha, ha. And then they took him out and scourged him with a cat of nine tails. And the outside historians tell us that formal scourging by the Roman lictor, we get our word licking from that. A lictor is a professional whipper. You knew how to use this whip with, le- with metal cleats fastened in with the leather thongs, go whoop around the man's back and to his face, tear the hide off his face, tear the hide off his body. Some people think, well, you know, he had a few drops of blood. You see all these paintings in the British Museum and in the National Art Gallery just off Trafalgar Square and then the Metropolitan. And the, the, I've been to all those places, of course, in in uh, the Louvre in, London, in uh, Paris and the Vatican Gallery in, in uh, St. Peter's, they don't show that at all, what happened. Christ looked like a raw piece of meat by the time they got through with him. God in the flesh was humiliated, beaten, cursed, spit on, torn to bits to pay for our sins. And part of that, of course, that formal licking, scourging, was to pay for our physical mistakes, how we're so careless. Well, I don't care, I'll just eat this anyway. And we'll go ahead and eat bad things, drink bad things, do bad things that hurt our bodies, and our body's the temple of the Holy Spirit. But we can be forgiven and healed supernaturally by God according to our faith. But as I've said, brethren, and I mean that profoundly, and as each year goes by, I realize it more profoundly, Once the liberals came in in the mid-70s and Mr. Armstrong traveled away more and more, that attitude of faith in God for healing got stamped out of the church almost totally. And it's never been totally revived. You know, I preach on it every now and then, probably more than anyone else. We're trying to revive it. Maybe we should have every other sermon devoted to it. I'm kidding. But people don't trust God for healing like they used to. Christ died for your spiritual sins. And Christ was scourged, and that broken bread symbolized his broken body for your healing. And and you know that's something the church has taught for decades, and Mr. Armstrong taught that. His vigils was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of man. So he shall sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths at him. For though it has not been told them, they shall see. And what they have not heard, they shall consider Later on, wow, the great men of the world are going to think, what on earth did we do? But they don't understand now. Remember, this was the scroll of Isaiah. Men later divided this into chapters and verses, just one long scroll. If you get the Old Testament scrolls, the Jews have preserved, or the New Testament, which I've seen, the various New Testament books. Who has believed our report? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of a dry ground. The ground was very dry at that time, very little true spirituality in Israel, and here Christ came, and these people hated him, made fun of him, and later killed him. He has no form nor comeliness, and when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. When you see these pictures of Christ, of course, they don't usually make him look very comely either. They usually have him look like some... uh, uh, some uh, aquiline-nosed uh, Dutchman or Englishman or something. They don't make him look like a Jew at all. He was a typical young Jew, and he looked so much like the other Jews, so much like them, that even though they had seen him going and coming, they wanted to be sure. So the Pharisees gave Judas 30 pieces of silver to be sure they got the right one. That's how much he looked like the other men. He wasn't terribly handsome. He wasn't terribly ugly. He was just a normal-looking Jew who fit right in. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. See, when he was being beaten, what happened? When he was first taken and questioned, you know, by the Jewish leaders, then Peter died, denied him three times and then cursed and swore. Said, I don't know the man, blah, 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 the third time, and cussed. And at that moment, Luke's account says, Jesus turned and looked at him. Apparently, they were just 60 or 70 or maybe even less yards apart somehow. And Peter was in the courtyard and Peter was, Jesus was in there being beaten. And this man turns and Peter went out and wept bitterly. He thought, what an ass I've been. Here is my God, my Savior. 
who's helped me, taught me the whole, and here I deny him three times and then start cussing, just like he said. Boy, Peter felt weak. Why? Because Peter was not perfect and because Peter had not received the Holy Spirit yet. Jesus told him a little earlier, when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. The Holy Spirit was with them, but not yet in them. So that's the answer to that. Peter was a strong man, but he got scared to death at the end. He couldn't fight. He didn't pray. Jesus said, why are you going to sleep? When Jesus was praying, he said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Pray. Well, they didn't pray. They went to sleep. And then the next early morning hours, they came to get him. Peter whips out his sword and chops off the ear of one of the men. And God, in John's account, shows it was Peter that did that. And then Jesus said, put up your sword. They that take the sword shall perish with the sword. He says, I can't pray. And Jesus doesn't want me to fight. What could I do? And he just got all frustrated and carnal because he was still carnal. And you were partly carnal. And I'm still partly carnal. And if we were caught in that kind of position, some of us would make some mistakes. We'd be scared to death. So let's have a little mercy on Peter. When we see him in the resurrection we better be careful what we say. <laughs> You'll have a higher position. You say, listen, Meredith, listen, you know, whatever your name is. Uh, if you were in the same position, you might have made a mistake too. That's right. We better not get too smarty pants about King David. Oh, look what you did. Because God tells it only, only in the matter of Uriah the Hittite, that one great sin, and it was a great sin, but nowhere else did David ever disobey direct commands from God in that way. And God makes that plain. So Peter made this terrible mistake and so on. But anyway, he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, smitten by God. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. And Peter paraphrases this in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24. And there, Peter's inspired by God to say, by his stripes, we were healed. He just changes that little bit because it had already been done. The penalty has already been paid. All we need to do is to really have faith that Christ died for us or faith that Christ was beaten to pay for our sins, our physical mistakes, real faith. But most of us don't walk with God and God is not that real to us and we don't have that faith as much as we should. All we like sheep have gone astray and so on. He said in verse 7, He was led as a lamb to the slaughter as a sheep before his shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. Remember, he didn't even try to argue with them on many occasions. For he was cut off from the land of the living, the transgressions for the transgressions of my people. For the sins of our people he was stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked. He was buried, you know, just in a carnal man's cemetery or a tomb. And with the rich, the guy apparently had money, had this big cave as a private tomb at his death. Because he, Christ, had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the eternal to bruise him. He was put to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand." He shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. Christ was resurrected and now looks back and was glad he went through that for us. And by his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many. But he shall bear their iniquities. He paid for our sins. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Christ is given the greatest office as King of kings and Lord of lords over the entire earth and the entire universe. Everything is under Jesus Christ except God the Father. And the Bible certainly indicates that. Why? Because he poured out his soul to death. He was numbered with the transgressors. Put to death like some rotten criminal, the most slow, agonizing death imaginable. And he bore the sins of many. Yes, he paid for our sins. And many, and he made intercession for transgressors. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't understand. They don't really get it. They're killing me, but they don't know what they're doing, Father. And he prayed for them right then. And that's a wonderful example. That was his attitude. So this was predicted 700 years. Details. 
details about this coming one that had that happen to him, our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Now let's notice the New Testament instruction about the Passover. And I'll have to hurry because we're, uh, I've taken a lot of time here. But turn to 1 Corinthians, if you would, brethren. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, first of all. 1 Corinthians, and this time chapter uh, 11. And notice what Paul writes. He says in verse uh, 23, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three. 23, Paul says to the Corinthian brethren, For I received from the Lord. Remember, Paul was taught directly by Christ in visions in, over in Arabia, that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. It describes in the Passover. Before going ahead, for those of you who may be new or uncertain, you know the Jews are always keeping the Passover the night after we do, you read about it in the paper the next day. And some of our brethren, again, they get all mixed up and everybody tries to decide for himself rather than letting the church decide those things, as Paul tells us in Colossians 2. But they try to figure it out on their own. This verse should make it very clear. When did Christ take the Passover? He took the Passover in the same night in which he was betrayed. And the next day he died, during the day, and it was that very night after he died and was crucified that the Jews kept their Passover. And if you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it makes that very clear. So we keep the Passover a day before the Jews because God has allowed the Jews to be deceived on a lot of things, including who their Messiah was, you know, and they got deceived about this matter as well. So he says, Christ then took the Passover the same night in which he was betrayed. He took the bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body. This little broken piece of bread symbolized the body of Jesus Christ, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Now, why does the bread come first? Because Christ was beaten first. When you follow through, he was beaten, then he was taken out to be crucified. So the bread comes first. In the same manner, he also took the cup, red wine, after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. And every indication from history and everything else would indicate it was certainly red wine, typifying Christ's shed blood. This cup is the new covenant. Represented that, a covenant was ratified by blood back then, and this represented that. The new covenant in my blood, this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. He doesn't say do it as often as you want to. Some of the Protestants read this verse, as often as you ever do it or want to do it, then you're proclaiming the Lord's death. No, it didn't say that. It didn't say do it every time you want to. It says as often as you do eat this bread. And how often do you eat it? You should eat it the way God tells you to. It is the Passover, and it comes once a year on the beginning of the 14th day, like God commanded, not some other time by human reason. So that's the key. We do it God's way, and Paul told them the way to do it, and so on. And then he said, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup in an unworthy manner, you're not to take it lightly and kid around or get some smart aleck attitude at the Passover. You have a, have a deep feeling about the shed blood of Jesus Christ and his broken body. So let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he who drinks and eats in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Even back then, you say, well, if we were as close to God as the early New Testament church, everybody would be healed. What's wrong with you, Meredith? Paul is saying, here is the church of God at Corinth, and he tells that church of God, an apostolic church, many of you are weak and sickly, and many sleep because you have not discerned the broken body of Jesus Christ. So we've got to have a deeper sense of awe about the broken body of Jesus Christ and his shed blood, and faith in what our Savior has done. So I hope we can work on that and pray about that and fast about that and try sincerely to draw close to God. Okay, now let's turn back to Matthew 26 at this point. 
Matthew chapter 26. And here in verse 17, Matthew 26, 17, on the first of unleavened bread, uh, the disciples came to Jesus saying, where do you want us to prepare the Passover? And most of you know the story. He said, go to this place and you'll find a room and prepare the Passover. So they did, and they sat down with the twelve. Verse 20, and as they were eating, Jesus said, one of you shall betray me. And then they wondered about that. And then verse 26, as they were eating, Jesus took bread. The bread comes first, blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink all from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, the shed blood to help ratify a covenant, to sow the seriousness of it, which is shed for many. Why? So we can be forgiven for the remission of sins, because God emptied himself in the person of Christ and came down here and died for us. That's why. But I say to you, I won't drink it again until the Father's kingdom. So then they sang a hymn and went out. Now in verse 36, then Jesus came with them to the place called Gethsemane and said, you stay here and I'm going to go over here and pray. And he took with him his leading disciples, Peter is always mentioned first, Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John. And he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed and said, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Watch with me. He went a little further and fell on his face. He was human. He had seen men crucified because that happened often in that time under that Roman dictatorship. He'd heard their screams and their groans. He knew what he was facing. Oh, my father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Not my will, but may your will be done. He comes back and finds the disciples asleep. He may have prayed for a long time, but they, they weren't zealous. They weren't converted. And he says, watch and pray, verse 41, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And so he prayed again. And finally then they went on their way. And then you uh, turn to Matthew 27. Let's turn over to chapter 27. And we find the crucifixion. Matthew 27 and now it's the next day, and Christ had been crucified. Now the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. A supernatural darkness. It was from 12 noon until 3 in the afternoon. That should have been the brightest part of the day. And about the ninth hour, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Jesus yells out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was symbolic in a sense. It had been predicted, but he felt that way. For the first time, he was, in a technical sense, cut off from God because our sins had been placed on him. Our sins had been placed on him, the Lamb of God, and he felt that distance. And he cried out. And then they tried to give him a sponge and other things and said, Is Elijah come and save him? And Jesus, when he cried out again, with a loud voice, yielded up his spirit. And... Behold, the veil of the temple was ripped in two from the top to the bottom. It was on over on another hill. This great big heavy sort of a woven thing like a Persian rug separating the Holy of Holies from the temple somehow is just ripped right in two supernaturally showing that we have direct access to God the Father finally. Earlier in Old Testament times only the high priest could go in there once a year on the Day of Atonement. Now we can come in several times a day. Other scriptures through the book of Hebrews and elsewhere explain that. That's a wonderful thing. We should think about that. So I want to go back here to verse 49 briefly. Let him alone. Let's see if Elijah will come and save him. And then you find here right after that in many of the ancient manuscripts, another took a spear, pierced his side, and there came out water and blood. That should be in there, by the way. And that is in many of the ancient texts. And Mr. Armstrong believed that. We've taught that. We've had articles on that. And it's in the Codice, Codices Vaticanus, Ephraim, Regida, and it's uh, in five other major manuscripts of the Old Testament, and the New Testament, I mean, that is in there. 
And Adam Clark's commentary on this verse, Genesis 49, I mean Genesis uh, 27, 49, explains that somewhat. And we've checked with other Greek experts, and some of them do acknowledge that should have been in there. I don't know why. In a sense, it's like Satan played a lot with that one thing. But Christ did not die of a broken heart. <laughs> Christ was the Passover lamb, and the blood came gushing out. Some unknown, unnamed Roman soldier, I used to think it was Italian, and later someone said, how do you know it's Italian? I said, you're right. They had a conscript army, the Roman government. They hired soldiers from all over. It's an unknown man from an unknown land heard Jesus groaning, perhaps. I'm just kind of picturing how it might have happened. And he was yelling or groaning in pain, which had been very normal. So, oh, shut up! And rammed this spear in his side, and out came water and blood, and the blood gushed out, and he died. And the blood of God, the blood of the Son of God, was shed like the Passover lamb, and that paid for our sins. Because Leviticus 17, 11, it says, The life is in the blood. And Christ's life was given for you and for me. Turn to Philippians now, if you would, brethren, briefly. Philippians chapter 1. Turn back to Philippians at this point. Chapter 1 and beginning in verse 18. Paul writes, What then, only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. For I know this will turn out for my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body. I read you this a number of times, but please don't ever get bored with it. This is a wonderful part of the Bible, that Christ may be magnified in my body, whether by life or death, for to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live on, this will mean fruit. I'll be producing fruit, but I don't know what's best. I'm hard-pressed between the two, having desire to be with Christ, which is far better, but to remain in the flesh is better for you. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you for your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. Now notice verse 27. Only let your conduct be worthy. Try to live that way, brethren. And as Mr. Smith was bringing out, bring forth fruit. Let your fruits be good because Christ should be in you. Let your conduct be worthy of the gospel. Here's the gospel of what? The kingdom of God? Yes. But it's the gospel of Christ. And the emphasis on Christ's sacrifice, the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit and in one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. So we want to understand that. That is such an important thing. And we want to have that attitude of having Christ live in us, Christ in us, the hope of glory. We want to be sure that as Paul, we could say that Christ, we want Christ to be magnified in my body, your body, whether by life or by death. However, we could magnify the one who died for us, our Savior, our living head, our merciful high priest, our coming king, an absolutely overwhelmingly vital part of the gospel. We want to honor him. For to me, to live is Christ. That's why we should live. That's why we should walk. That's why we should move ahead and do His work and honor Him because He is our Savior, our living head, our high priest, and He is our coming King as well, whom we honor in all those ways and must continue to do so and not ever get turned aside and to try to honor any man, any man instead of Christ and what Christ taught and what the Bible actually says. Let's do that. Let's have a profound feeling about the gospel of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice 